LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi, everyone. Stephen Van Tassel, Vertebrate Pest vertebrate pest specialist yes that's my day job i got a little screwed up here so again i'm from wildlife control consultant really glad to have you on board here we have a very special guest of course you those of you been following the podcast are familiar with it dr neem quinn of university of california cooperative extension she is now get this title now this is uh this is california so we'll let you uh deal with that in your own human wildlife interactions advisor how about that so i my day job is vertebrate pest specialist but she's a human wildlife interaction advisor but there is a lot of counseling in our work isn't there dr quinn yes it's i'd say half of my job is counseling <laughs> with people well really glad to have you on board we're uh we're we're interested in some of the work that you've done oh, first tell us a little about yourself obviously and then uh just to remind those who are new to the podcast what what you're what you do and then some of the we'd like to get some into that some of that research you've done on rats and then of course your rodent academy that you're offering of course Things are full, almost pretty much full by now. Probably by the time this goes out, it'll be full. But people may want to stay tuned or maybe draw it to their state. So we'll let, let's see how that goes. Well, as you said, Stephen, I'm the Human Wildlife Interactions Advisor. Um, but at the office, they call me the Rat Whacker. So that the kind rat of is, whacker. So that's like oh. the, sub, the subtitle to what I do. But I, I'd, yes. say, I'd say, you know, my program is kind of, because I work with Extension, my program is split like kind of 50-50 between um research and then extending the information that we get from the research to the people that need it so in my case it's it's mostly pmps but i also do coyote work so mm -hmm. sometimes it's like you know wildlife managers people like residents or city folks you know city managers and stuff like that because um as you may or may not know there's there's coyotes everywhere yeah they may they're... be as ubiquitous as the rats now in some of the cities in california oh my goodness that's amazing yeah, it's uh so, it's so... pretty cool when we go to catch them as well because they're much easier to catch now that there's so many so many of them oh no kidding all right well so i we would you know i think our audience would be very interested in coyotes you know coyotes was kind of almost like a sacred cre creature within the vertebrate pest community and the certainly the fur industry as well uh or the or the rodent one we hope you talk about both but anything new coming along what have you been doing well we're working hard on a number of projects um we just finished uh, a best management practices project that was funded by the california department of pesticide regulation and the idea behind that was to try and see if there are like like are there different successes among the different management types um and i have to say like where we started was was trying to develop best management practices and and it's trying to develop best management practices to like reduce rodenticide exposure but also to manage rodents right, right. those two things are equally as important as each other and so you know it was kind of difficult and so here in california you know your listeners may or may not know we have some you know serious rodenticide issues although with the the you know the proposed interim decisions with epa our california's problems could become everybody else's problems yeah, too right um and so you know my thought was is that we would go from the like the kind of the creme de la creme of what is considered the best in rodent management which is second generation anticoagulant rodenticides mm -hmm to what would happen if we didn't have anticoagulant rodenticides which or any kind of rodenticide which is a trapping only program and then something in the middle which was a mix of both so and you so tested had, those three hypotheses then yeah okay. and, and we tested it in a number of ways um the first way we used is is we use these tracking tunnels these tracking tunnels are they're becoming really popular um in in especially in california rodent research but i've seen them in other rodent research projects in the us now as well but they're really popular in new zealand which right. is actually the yeah. only place that you can purchase them from they're expensive which, though they're and, and you know what it's not that they're expensive it's getting them to the oh, US is expensive. Oh, okay. yeah and then all the bureaucracy with customs and all that kind oh, of stuff gosh. yeah it's, okay. uh, it's definitely a pain in the rear end but um we use them and then um, th I have to say, this is one of the, the most bizarre research projects I've ever been involved in because we caught the rats and we put little collars on them okay. and then we let them go. And then we tried to kill them, which is usually not what happens when you do yeah. these kinds of wildlife tracking programs. Yeah. Usually you hope that when you call because you spend so much effort and money trying to collar these animals that you hope that they live for a long time, right. but not us. 
And so we, um, so that was kind of, we looked to see like how long these animals would survive essentially, because the, with the anticoagulant rodenticides, we wouldn't necessarily always recover the body. And in fact, we almost never recovered the body, even though we could track to where the rat was, we all like, we very, very rarely because, and I think that reflects the, um, the, like at least the small amount of evidence we have for carcass collection um, here in California, we've got one study that suggests that I think it's something like 85% of ground squirrels die below ground, like yes. inaccessible to predators. And then I think um, in Europe, they have another study that says for nori rat control, like 90 something percent of their animals died in spots that were inaccessible to large predators. So it makes sense, right, that we even though we were there every day, we still weren't really recovering either like animals that were kind of, you know, drunk on rodenticide, so yeah. to speak, you know, like either sub lethally exposed or lethally exposed and just hadn't died yet or yeah. animals that had died and, and we just didn't recover their body, which is interesting and also interesting for the current proposed interim decisions too right. that is we are requiring carcass searches for for many applications not in urban areas but in in agricultural areas right. and i have to say Stephen, i was blown away by the results because it really really surprised me that like there's and you know scientists are really good at answering one question and coming up with 50 more i feel like that's more actually what we're good at than actually solving the science <laughs> sometimes well if you solve a problem you're going to be out of a job aren't you yeah, so, pretty you know. much, right? and, <laughs> and so um we like what we, what we did was, you know, we, we a analyzed the results and it showed that trapping was way more effective than either of the two other strategies. For, and rat, so, for rats. For rats. For rats. Okay. For roof rats. Because here roof rats. where I am in California, we're very much in kind of roof rat territory. Okay. Um, and I think that we're going to need more and more research on roof rats because at least anecdotally, it appears that they are rapidly expanding across the United States. Now, they may never get to Montana, right. but they're coming up the like coming up like southwards Coast. and then, yeah. you know, spreading up across the eastern seaboard as well. Um, and so it was really interesting. But we had rodents that were like we were trying to expose to rodenticides that were still moving after 100 days. 100 days did they just not well i thought within like, that you were using second gens and they were still moving after 100 now when you were looking for the bodies uh because you obviously were getting a death signal right you were getting a death signal did you did, were you digging up to the location no, we didn't dig anything we just couldn't they just we just knew that they stopped moving they stopped moving and so you never yeah. tried to find so you so we walked did try a lot of collars we did try and find some of them but we couldn't we just couldn't we just couldn't right. recover them and oh so like they could have gotten predated on they could have yeah. gotten picked up i mean who knows but we just know that they it was stopped moving moving okay um yeah and so it was really interesting and like trying to hypothesize you know, because we already know from our previous research that like the roof rats, they don't really like the bait stations. Right. You right. And that, we're right. we are actually starting another project. We actually just started the fieldwork for that last Friday um, to try and see, can we improve the use of the bait stations? Right. But like we are trying to figure out, like, why would a trap in a bait station work better than a bait in a bait station? Right. A toxic bait in a bait station. And really the hypothesis that we came up with was is that it's just way there's way less decisions for the rat to make to die in a bait station with a trap than in a bait station with yeah. a bait. Yeah, because um, you're just relying on movement. He just needs to move in the right direction. He doesn't need yeah. to eat anything. So it doesn't that makes need to sense. eat, it doesn't need to eat enough. You right. know what I mean? Like there's there's a couple of things. It doesn't like it you, you can't be resistant to a trap. Yeah, yeah. So although we did have a funny situation one morning in a school where I mean, I have so many funny situations in the lab all the time, but my, you know, we caught a load of rats, we put collars on them, you know, I'm like, I'll let these ones go over here where these ones and then my my staff was like, Oh, well, I'll let this one over here where we caught it too. Right. And I, we're, I was coming, I hadn't seen her and I was coming back to meet her and we're in the morning in a school, right? There's kids are starting to shuffle in. And I see the face and I just know I just know that something is wrong. <laughs> And I was like, what happened? And she's like, well, I let it go. And the first thing it did was run straight into a trap station. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, she's, and she said, that I, then I heard a sh And she's like, oh, my God. Yeah, like, that's it. Hard, right? And so then she said she opened the bait station and the rat was in there like, ooh, like this, just inside the bait station going, what is happening with my life? 
So, oh the, so she's like, okay, let's just get out of the bait stage, let's get out of the trap station. So the, she encourages the rat to leave. And it just makes a beeline for the only group of kids in the entire <laughs> like school year. <laughs> and yeah, all right. so, like, it, they're like eating their breakfast at this like picnic table, and the rat yeah. like shoots right under it, and it like shoves itself in under a pipe. Yeah. And the teacher's like, "Oh, I'm assuming you're going to take care of that." And I was like, "Absolutely." And my staff <laughs> goes, "What are you going to do?" And I go, "Absolutely nothing." <laughs> I was like, that's two hundred and fifty dollars of a rat right there. That's right. Like, that doing it's a thing. There. Oh my so, gosh! Yeah. What trap were you using in your trap stations? Um, we were using um the the VM ones with the um. Have you seen those ones with the zip tie? So um, oh, they were okay, the VM traps. So they were the striker. Uh, the that the half striker bar so you didn't have to touch the business end not like a yeah, regular just, wood stream like, pull, yeah you just pull the thing out there with so. zip okay yeah and we don't have a those are pretty for... those are pretty cool i like because you don't have yeah. to i mean they definitely saved, they definitely saved us some time but we yeah. don't like we we just take whatever is generously donated to oh us. i see yeah so, yeah I, I, <laughs> Yeah. Those are well, a little shout out to VM for contributing. That's really important. And so it's I'm always I'm always pleased when companies are willing to let their equipment go out for testing because there's a risk for that. Yeah, I mean, there's we don't, it's not, it wasn't even like we were really. I mean, I think that a lot of the time, like, you know, this time around for our bait station research, like we just say that we're testing a conventional bait station because in my mind, Stephen, they're all the same. All bait stations are essentially the same. Yeah. And um, they they vary very little in design. And mm -hmm. I would love to know where the design from the bait station actually came from, because I feel like bait stations were designed to keep non-targets away from bait. They weren't designed to um kill rats. Right. And 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 clearly in in what we're seeing, they're not they're not. I mean, they're they really aren't. And it could be like a number of things, right? It could be placement. It could be design. Yeah. It it could be you know it could be population. It could be resistance. For all we know, it like it could be it could be a number of different things. But we don't know. And yeah. like it, you can't like if you don't know how it's broken, you can't fix it. Right. Right. Yeah. So so our think... new our new project is funded by the Pest Management Foundation, okay. um, which is great. Um, and we are looking at trying to improve the use of the bait stations. I keep telling my students, like, we're trying to get the butts in the seats. <laughs> right. Now, I mean, we don't know what happens when the rat gets in there, but we're trying to get the rat in there is half the battle. Right. Okay. If we can get the rat in the bait station. And so. We're looking at different bait station designs, so kind of conventional, a kind of a long tube type bait station. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the rocks. We're also looking at some um, new like scents, like or attractants, maybe you could call them. I mean, it's okay. hard to call things attractants because right. I don't I mean, it's hard to know like how far out they work. But like yeah. we will have bait stations with no attractant and bait stations with attractant. And, mm -hmm. and we'll be looking to see. Like, does it increase the time that the? Because there's a couple of things we want to we want to do. We want to get the rat in there quicker, right? Because there's there's a delay, which we all know, right? right. There's a delay of entry, but the delay is about ten days. Ten days is a, a long, long time if long you've time. got a bad rodent issue, right? If you're a PMP out there on the ground, like you can't lie to your customer and be like, I'm going to fix this straight away because you're not. Right. Even if you have the ability, if you're outside of California, to use a second gen, if you think of it, that's 10 days, probably plus five, probably. Right. If you're using a first gen, it's probably pl plus 10, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're using yeah. an acute rodenticide, well, then it's less. But like it's it's it takes a long time. So we're trying to reduce that. We want to increase the amount of the population that uses the bait station as well. That's a little harder for us to measure. Um, and then we want to increase the amount of bait that's consumed. And that's really important for a place like California, where we may not have access to second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, right? We're relying on acute rodenticides where the amount of, and obviously the amount of any bait consumed is very important. Right. But right. when baits are 
I would never say that a bait is not palatable. If it's registered by the EPA, it's considered palatable, right? But there's, you could probably say that there's a scale of palatability with some of these baits. Yeah, um, well, certainly that's been the experience. I mean, the fat, you know, the soft baits have certainly found to be more, at least that's what some of the research says. And I think anecdotally, it's been found to be the case as well, that the fat, animals like fat. So, I mean, it's just... So do yeah. we. <laughs> yeah. That's so, right. High high fat, high sugar, high protein. I was like a bit yeah. a bit like myself. That's it, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> if it's bad for you, it's probably tastes good. So yeah. yeah well that, so those are so you're looking at are you gonna be looking at specific brands of stations? Or are you looking at different types? Like you just talked about a tube, which sounds to me like the PVC inverted T not, style. So I mean I can say which which ones were like we're I mean we're not it's not really I can tell you the brands of what we're testing, but it's mm -hmm. more the fact that they're different shapes. I think right. that like so we're looking at a rock from JT Eaton, but that's yeah. also very similar to the rock from like mm -hmm. Bell and some of the other companies. Okay. And then we're looking at um it was actually, it was some, and it's funny, you know, you always think you have a great idea and then so, you, you realize that your idea is just not that great because someone's already made it. So right, we were right. actually going to yeah. 3D print our own bait stations. And that actually came off our, our best management practices work because what we saw was, is that our tracking tunnels, which are long, mm -hmm. rectangular, right, right, they're long, uh, they're not a tube, they're long and rectangular. Right, right. They were you. The rats loved them, Stephen. In and out, and in and out, and in and out all day, every day. Right? They just they had no problems with them. Right? So here you have a bait station with a lot of food in it, and they're not going into it, but they are going into the the tracking tunnels. And now, like, try to describe it to your yeah, and I'll try and describe it to your listeners because it's it 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 wouldn't be appropriate for bait, right? It's very open on one end, right? It's just mm -hmm. a piece of cardboard that's in a long, like rectangular tunnel, right? It's I guess it's a tunnel. Yeah. And so we were gonna we were gonna print something based on that, but we were gonna close off the ends, right? Now we were gonna make sure that you could see through, and obviously you need certain there's certain criteria you need. And then I was at Pest World, and um one of the sales guys from um Kness came up to me, and I was I was telling him, he's like. A bit like this thing, and mm -hmm. I was like, "Holy crap!" Exactly yeah. like that thing. They have an inverted. They have an inverted T version. It has baffles it's, in it too. It's not. A, it's actually not a T. It's a long tunnel, exactly like the tracking tunnel that has. And it's. It's. I think it's more marketed for trapping. Okay. But there are baffles. You can put baffles in it as well. All right, that's something new I haven't seen because they have a. Because uh, I'm hoping to try out some of their inverted tea stations on Richardson ground squirrels. Yeah. And so, um, because PVC pipe has just gotten ridiculous so in price. Yeah. So, yeah. well, this, yeah, this is, I think this type of ground research. And so now I would be wondering, well, if you're going to, if you're going to 3d manufacture your own station, you could mimic the long tube, but you still have to have a way to store the bait. So the rodent yes. would still have to stop. Yes. And part of the reason is you look, they, they like those stations, you know, stations that have an L in it so that an animal from the outside can't reach in and grab or a kid. It, and so, yeah, it'd be interesting to find out how that I mean, would I think it's, it's going to be really interesting. And so we do a lot of our research in, um, you know, backyards and we, um, we, we have the master gardeners, which I, I, I think are in every, like in every like cooperative extension in every state. I think they are, so, yeah. And but then, so we're 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 doing most of our like the this type of, excuse me, experiment in 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 the backyards. But then, we hope to upscale it a bit. Um, and so what what we're what I I mean I'm interested in so many things, Steve. Right. Like so many things, but you know you've probably heard this, and probably your listeners have heard this idea of like the alpha rat, the super rat protecting mm -hmm. the bait station. Like right. there's not really any evidence of that, but like it could be like it could be totally true. And like I think that knowing more about how populations use the bait stations is going to be really important for management, especially when you get to like places where in California where they are probably going to consider limitations on placements, right? Right. Like, you know, like they have in BC, like British Columbia, like they have in like places like Europe, like that's probably going to happen. And if it happens in California, it's coming for everybody else. It like is, I yeah, think just... what's coming down in EPA 
it's a small taster of what's going to happen in oh the future. i think there's definitely california influence there without a doubt and um yeah so i would be i think there are so many questions and so i guess the question would be for me and that is you know california one advantage is you have the vertebrate pest council you have funding for different projects that other states aren't putting effort into because it's such a widow thing. I mean, I envy the, what I call the bug killers and the weed people. They got billion dollar industries behind them to come up with another active ingredient because they know they've got millions of acres that they can sell for because everyone's going to have the weed problem. Everyone's going to have the bug problem. When it comes to vertebrates, you know, you have some really good companies, but they don't have the kind of money to put through the research requirement to get through EPA registration and it's, there's no money. It's, it's like, you know, no, they would go broke. It's a really expensive process. And like, if you want to get stuff in, re in, in, in registered in California, like you need a whole other set of studies oh, and like yeah, a whole other just, set of paperwork. It's like, it's doubly registered. And, yeah. and, you know, we've gotten really great industry, industry, it, sorry, industry support right. from everyone that gives us like hand sanitizer to, you know, mm -hmm. companies that are developing isotopically labeled bait with us. You know, so we've gotten all types of, and like all of it matters, right? So like the yeah. isotopically labeled bait is 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 obviously really great, but like we still need the hand sanitizer to make sure yeah. we don't die. So, right. Like, yeah. And I, but I think there's, but we still need as good, as great as that is what we, you, you almost need like a space shot, right? Where you have, you know, it would be, and it's all well and good. And I want to diminish the type of contributions, but I just want our audience to kind of think about, you know, the kind of money you would need to have. 10 grad students with two workers with two assistants for each one for the field component now you're able to construct the kind of research where it's dovetailing enough where you can start answering the questions at a group rather than sliver here sliver here then wondering if there's untoward effects that you're not that you're missing at the same time and you know is there environmental changes that make this study work better than another you know, if someone came up, you know, to put some numbers to it, where, you know, dropped 20 or $30 million on you. Now you have 10 grad students. They're all, you know, you don't have to train them. They know the, the statistics and, and you're helping them design their model. They're going to do their master's or maybe a PhD. They got two assistants, all the gas money they need, the vehicles, and you just like do it. And, you know, in three or four years, how much information would you be able to gather out of that? Because you'd have the publications, everything would be funded up the wazoo, and you wouldn't have to be trying to piecemeal stuff together. I mean, that's I the, it's not a lot of money when you think about it, what we blast into space, right? I mean, one, one trip from a, a Challenger or something was a billion dollars every flight. I mean, just, you know, just take, We'll just take the fuel that you put in and we'll be fine. And how much we would be able to get and we would have the answers as much as you would ever know the answer. And and that's the challenge. It's like, you know, 20 or $30 million in the scheme of things. It's not a huge amount of money, but it is for our industry. I think if I had 10 grad students, I'd be dead, first of all. But well, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I just threw out 10, but uh, yeah. but, uh, but, I, but I, I think they would be different in the sense if you had some PhD level who are doing their mm -hmm. final thesis and they had a, you know, a, maybe some grad students working as their assistants or something, but everyone wasn't worrying about whether they had to, you know, eat at McDonald's this week because they were well-funded and you're getting the best students, people really committed. I mean, you'd probably be doing, you'd probably be busy, but you'd also be like, yeah, I don't have to worry about whether I can write this check this week. Yeah. Well, well, we've, you know, it cost me $80,000 a year to hire staff. Yeah. It's, it's a lot and they don't, actually physically earn eighty thousand dollars right, right? They have all the great, expenses they, they have, have great benefits right and obviously we have overheads and whatever um and it's and it's a good job but like when you live in orange county or la it's it's yeah, really yeah. not a lot of money no, now not. if you live in like modoc up in northern california it's tons of money um, and yeah. well not tons of money but it's certainly more money but yeah. you know we've been really lucky i work with dr paul stappa at cal state fullerton and mm -hmm. um, i've essentially infected his lab um <laughs> with my projects and he loves them and I, and I love working with him and you know it's really easy to excite him about yeah. rodent work because nobody like we know like i say this all the time we know more about polar bears than we do about commensal rodents and i don't understand why and i think back to your point about like 
funding part of the problem is I mean a huge part of the problem is money money but like how many rodentologists have you do you have on your like as guests on your show well if I can even know well you have to get them on the show that's part of the part of the problem um and so yeah there aren't many and and I do think there's a glamour I mean a lot of people when they go to school to learn about wildlife they want to go hug a bear somewhere right I mean it's so the charismatic megafauna and this is what the problem we have with wildlife damage control or wildlife damage management is. He had students, well, I want to go work for a state agency and go hug a bear. Well, they don't mm-hmm. phrase it quite like that, but that's really what's in the back of their mind, right? And I'm like, and I, I, because I interviewed some people, I was driving them in a van when I was at the University of Nebraska. I was just a, you know, a helper over there. And I was driving them. I said, how many of you are biology students, you know, wildlife students? And they raised their hands. And I said, well, how many of you going into wildlife control? No one. And I said, well, that's too bad because that's at least where that's where a job is. You know, and they, I'm sure they didn't believe me, <laughs> but, but because they all think they're going to work for a state agency and go hug a bear and yeah. they're going to be out in the woods somewhere. And I'm like, oh, that's just not, even the people who work with bears are primarily in an office and yeah. running paperwork or doing FOIA requests all day or getting yelled at by someone. Why are you killing bears? You know, whatever the case may be. And so there's a, it's kind of the, you know, rats, everyone thinks, oh, it's just a rat or it's just a mouse. And they don't take it seriously. They don't realize the kind of problems that we have. I mean, there, and there's so many issues and like, there's so many things like one of our, and and like one of our new projects is is just looking at, at rat diet. Mm. Um, and we haven't asked for any funding yet, um, but we are hoping to get some funding for it because, the thing about rat diet is, and this is our hypothesis, and I think it's very accurate for roof rats. I'm not sure about mice and Norways, although we will want to look into that as well, is that sanitation actually doesn't matter for roof rats, which is kind of an in- interesting concept because yeah. when you think of IPM, and I come from the school of IPM, <laughs> right, right. you know, sanitation is almost number one on the list. Right. Right. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't have a really bad problem that sanitation yeah. can't help, yeah. but like there are no, there's no trash in my yard, Stephen, right. none, no trash in my yard. I could kill rats all day, every day out there, all day, mm-hmm. all day, every day. There's rats everywhere, all day, right. right? We have a very roof rat rich environment all over Southern California. And I would say that that's actually extends to a lot of the rest of California. And especially in Southern California, right? We're suburbia, wealthy in a lot of areas. It is not dirty. There is no trash. Yeah. And so, and I think that's really important because people that don't understand management, like what it actually takes to manage rats, like how hard a PMP actually has to work to solve a problem. People that don't want rodenticides, that think that you can solve the issue with exclusion, and sanitation i i just i just don't think that's true especially for roof rats so let me ask it, let me probe that a little bit more so if we're talking about keeping the rat out of the structure mm-hmm. would exclusion and sanitation be sufficient i'm not talking about the backyard because I, I you know it would that work so exclusion is really important i yeah. think like exclusion is 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 it has to be I mean, your number one defense. Number one. Okay. So let me ask the next question. That is, so I think I was told by someone, because I I don't have any experience with roof rats. I would love to. I think they're really cool. But I was told that roof rats are basically squirrels without the pretty tail. And so, you know, I'm from, being from Massachusetts, squirrels were my number one money maker. I made money off squirrels more than any other speed. That was half of my business was squirrels. Uh, and so if that's the case, then yeah, sanitation was not going to solve the problem. Exclusion, if you wanted to keep them out of a building, that certainly did work. Although sometimes squirrels had pretty good chompers, I mean, gray squirrels and the fox squirrels. I don't, so that would certainly make a lot of sense. But if you were just trying to keep so if we maybe we need to have a different attitude toward roof rats that they're not the same beast as Norway. No, they're they're totally not. And I think I think as well, Stephen, like it's different. Like so, where I am in Southern California, and like other areas of California and the Southwest, 
it's very different to the freezing cold that a lot of people are experiencing right now, right? right. People live a lot of their lives in the outside. Ah, uh, yeah. Right. So then they so, want to see a rat going across their table. Not even seeing it. Like if you like, we we do a lot of our research in schools, right? And so. And I don't know, like, I don't have kids, Stephen, and I don't know if this is universal, but mm-hmm. it seems to me that elementary kids are nice and clean and mm-hmm. teenagers are absolutely gross. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, <laughs> that's what it seems like from my experience in the different <laughs> types of schools in California. However, I go to like element very clean elementary schools and like these janitors just take so much pride in like making their environment for their kids mm-hmm. where their kids eat right they eat in the outside no very few kids in southern california are eating in the classroom right they're oh really okay classroom. all right well that's they're de- definitely different right yeah. and so you, like it's not like exclusion is not going to solve that and yet in these schools we were coming across so many rats and like it was like these schools were so clean that like when it came to us placing like like control measures like I couldn't even really think of places to put them Stephen right we weren't like going like the whole like 15 feet or whatever like you know we were trying to be very strategic about how we manage things and yeah I'm like there's so many rats here and I know because I've caught them um and yet there's no trash no trash trash cans are always covered they were living it. They were living in the AC units. They were living. On, they were burrowing. And you know, people always say roof rats don't burrow. Right. That's not they true, burrow, right? It's not. I mean, it's not very common. Yeah. But it's not true. And so you know, living like burrowing under like maybe like um like a kind of a, a like a like a stone step or whatever that was mm-hmm. just in front of a classroom that yeah. was on like a grassy bit or whatever. But like in these and like all we we love to trap by the AC units. So like they're you know and it's. And it's funny because there's all these different things that come up and I don't know anything about construction, but, you know, we were kind of talking beforehand about like using ladders and whatever, right? A little bit mm-hmm. before we started. Yeah. So like the reason the ACs are on the ground is because they don't want their maintenance people up on ladders on the roof, right? It's, right. it's more dangerous. Sure. Oh, absolutely. It would but, be. but these rats are all over these AC units, like all over them. And obviously you're in Southern California, so you've got lots of AC and so there's like, you know, there's two or three of these outside, like loads of like different parts of the schools. And right. Yeah. It's because it's best, place, it's best place for, and we were live trapping the rats for, for, for some of our research. So, but mm-hmm. like, but these schools were spotless, spotless. And so like, what I are they thought, eating? But, so what are they eating? That's what I'm saying, right? It's not a, I don't think it's a sanitation issue. I think they're relying on landscape plants sure. or, yeah. or like natural vegetation mm-hmm. or, maybe maybe even invertebrates which would seem a bit weird but i we don't know like we yeah. have no, no idea. i think that's yeah because basically like that's why i wonder if we need to get to a place or maybe or not me but southern california needs to get to a place that roof rats are basically your squirrel your well, we have squir- we have your squirrels too. Well, we have like the eastern fox squirrels too. Yeah, they, so th- maybe they that's, like kids in th- this is <laughs> one. This is one that doesn't have a pretty tail. This one over here has a pretty tail. They're both yeah. just part of the environment. Uh, but I just would guess that the roof rats maybe have higher densities than than your tree squirrels. Are I mean, higher? I would, say, I would say so. Um, yeah. And also, right, tree squirrels are not native to. Um, right, they've been introduced. Right, right. Okay. you know, the, the eastern fox squirrel is not native. The eastern gray squirrel is not native, and they're kind of like the urban squirrels. Like we've okay. got like the the western. Yeah. Um, which is a beautiful squirrel. I always like in yeah. my head. I can like I think oh this squirrel is native and it's absolutely <laughs> stunning, and then this squirrel <laughs> is non native and it's ugly, and, and I think that's coming from. From Ireland, where we have our own native red squirrel, and then yeah. this ugly American introduced that's, right. That, yeah. That's <laughs> pushing out your red squirrel. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm well. I'm looking forward to this research. What are you? What is your timeline? You're looking at, and is this going to be like a couple of years to to get yeah, some of I mean, this we, data? We just started on Friday, um, and which was well, sorry, the diet data or the bait station data? Whatever, whichever project uh, you go. Well, on. we haven't started the diet data yet. We still need okay. to get try and get some money for it. But we have a great student lined up for the project, which which helps. Mm-hmm. Um, we just started our bait station research on Friday, and it's you know it's so great because you know it it just goes to show you like the variability, and obviously like we, that's something that we have to come across, but like or we have to overcome, but like. 
the yards are so different like like sometimes there's like loads of fruit in them and then the next thing we're in a yard that like has a boat on its porch right up next to a lake um and like they have rats and someone like everybody with the fruit has rats and then someone with hardly any fruit has rats and it's just really it's very interesting and it'll be interesting to see like how they use the different bait stations and if we can improve and like that's what we're trying to do like we're trying to improve the use of the bait station yeah. and like if you can improve the use of the bait station you can also in, improve the utility of the trap inside the bait station yeah. too right yeah. it's not yeah. just about pesticide but we well not we but like this industry 99 percent of people are relying on these black boxes right. to help them manage their issue and at least for roof rats it's just not an appropriate management technique, yeah, but we don't have yeah. anything else. Yeah. And so it makes you, but I, it's sometimes, you know, if there's a traditionalism in pest control at times where we just do something because it's the way we've always done it. But and what else do you do, Stephen? That, where else? I agree. You know what I mean? And there's no, I feel like there's literally like, and this is a terrible pun, but there's literally nobody thinking outside the box. No, that's well, we, it's, it's expensive to do so. And then there's always risk. And you know, I encourage my audience, I list, you know, 5% of your job should be experiment tweaking with things just to try something new. You know, but, uh, you know, obviously it's not scientific research per se, but you know, you're not going to get a competitive edge on someone unless mm -hmm. you're doing something different. I just and, I just think there's so much pressure on PMPs. Like it's funny, like we were when we were doing our best management practices, we took over the management of all the accounts, right? Mm -hmm. We we essentially just kicked the PMP to the curb. Right. And we were in one HOA in um in uh, in in Mission Viejo in Southern California, which is very very much like a planned community. Like it's okay. just planned community after planned community after very, very nice neighborhoods, very well planned. And Terry from Accurate Pest Control, I will tell you that that man earned every single cent <laughs> of what he was paid for that job. Um, Gosh. It was it was it was like we managed something like three hundred and fifty something bait stations in one community. Okay. And like to oh and like we we service them every thirty days, which was kind of like the norm, right? Mm -hmm. And like in my head, I'm thinking like every time we did it, I just thought in my head, and like we had to record consumption now. Recording consumption is, it's not a great way to manage, like to get a gauge on the population, right? Because you could have right. one rat that comes back over and over again. Right, you could right. have had one rat that fed right there and then when you put the bait out. But, you know, we had other tools that would, you know, like helped us, you know, you know, S massage the data a little yeah. bit, to make it make more sense for us. And so we did that and like it's it was roast and hot. Obviously, I'm Irish in case anybody hasn't guessed yet. So I'm not like the best person, like you can see here from the skin tone. Like, it, you know, <laughs> it was really, really difficult. And like, I just think like, how does Terry have five minutes to think outside the box? Right. He just doesn't. Like, he really just doesn't. And like, it's not only that, like then Terry has to go and do like 300 bait stations in another community. Yeah. And so I... I think it would be great if they had the time. I just don't think they're given the time. And often in their license in California, there is no room for creativity, right? There's, if you're a certain license type, you just go and you do what you're told. Yeah. Well, that's the end of part one of my conversation with Dr. Neem Quinn of the University of California Cooperative Extension. Uh, you, can, you can tell uh, she is a wealth of information and there are very few people that specialized in rodent rodents and rodent control and the whole complexity regarding their management and she is one of them so we're really grateful that she came back this year and gave us a two-hour uh, interview where we were discussing her research and her thoughts about uh, rodent control you've been listening to living the wildlife as part of the pest geek podcast family so we divided this up love to hear from you you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com and you can uh, give me your thoughts comments suggestions for new shows perhaps you want to be on the show we'd love to hear from you and of course I uh, hope you're going to stay tuned because we're going to follow up with part two with Neem Quinn, and that's going to be in the next episode. So stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. And again, this is Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.